Mental health advocate Steven Swenson. How are you doing today, sir? Hey, I'm good, bro. How are you? I'm doing good. So I have Steven on today to speak about his journey uh, with mental health and also with it personally, but also being an advocate for it to support others and break the stigma around it, but also bring attention to best practices with uh, maintaining uh, mental health, but holistic health in a general sense. So I know when we say mental health advocate, a lot of people might not be sure exactly what that means. So could you walk us through the certification process? Okay. Um, there's a bunch of different certifications that you can kind of look into. Um, I looked into suicide prevention, a uh, suicide prevention certification. There was a mental health first aid certification that I wanted, but the class was sold out. Um, it was like a certain amount of money that I didn't have at the time anyway. Uh, but they wound up offering it, um, at my job, um, at the library of Congress. And, um, I was able to get that certification while I was at work. So that was a blessing. And, um, they also offered another course. It's called it's real with, um, the AFSP. It's like the American suicide foundation, basically. Um, so basically I wound up getting about four certifications. The, uh, the process is you could just Google them and apply to each of them and somebody will contact you. So, uh, I have a little bit of information, but I want to bring everyone else into this. So you got into wanting to advocate for this and bring awareness and help others that are working through it. But I understand that it hit home for you personally first. So if you could start with. Uh, what did you see in yourself or what was going on with you personally that you began to feel that you had something that needed to be addressed as far as your mental health? And then later when you began to take those steps, who did you go see and what were their, what were their findings? Okay. First, um, I guess noticing different signs that possibly something might've been wrong. Um, in high school, I used to run the 800 meter dash. I don't know why they call it. Oh, 800 meter run. I'm running 800 every single time, the same exact way. Every time they blow the gun, I would get out in front of everybody and be dusting them by like 200 meters. And I would die after the first 200 meters. I mean, after the last, at the last 200 meter mark and everybody would catch me and they would, they would be thinking I'm going to set a record or something. So they'd be cheering for me. And then I just die. And I did this for about two years straight. And I couldn't fix it, but I had no clue that there were, I was showing signs of anxiety. I showed signs of anxiety in college when I did all this training, um, getting ready for an event for the 200 meter dash. And then I just froze during the 200 meter dash and I pretend like I hurt my hamstring. I was like, uh, yeah, I don't know what just happened. And I had all eyes on me. You know, I had some of my professors come out to see me, some of my friends. That was a sign for me that something was wrong. Um, it happened again at uh, Nike Invitational where I was running on a huge stage. I froze up again and I was like, man, something is wrong. The The time when I finally decided to acknowledge it was when I, I decided not to go back to college for my senior year. And... I was dealing with, with heavy, heavy depression. So I, I, I couldn't get out of bed. I didn't return back to college uh, for my senior year. And then eventually while I was working, I just jumped right into working immediately, even though I was dealing with depression. Um, I went up having a mental breakdown. And for us millennials that are hardworking and we're all trying to be on the 30 for 30 roster, we know what a mental breakdown is. Um, once we reach that point, because we're all high functioning adults, whereas somebody that might not have worked as hard in certain areas, um, work at working at a certain level for, for as long might not realize what a breakdown might feel like. Um, we know what a breakdown feels like cause we, we function at a very high level for a very long time. That seems to be what being a millennial is all about. Um, how many appliances and, and um, pieces of tech 
can you operate uh, in eight hours uh, simultaneously? So anyway, um, I wound up having a breakdown and um, I couldn't believe myself. Like I had just snapped and I, I, I wasn't myself. I, I just, I could, I, I didn't want to talk to anybody. I couldn't leave my, my room. Eventually I wound up leaving and going to Shepherd Pratt in Baltimore. Um, one of my closest friends uh, told me about Shepherd Pratt. So I, I drove out there with a little bit of courage that I had left. And um, I talked to them. They gave me the option to do outpatient or inpatient. And thank God I chose outpatient because at the time I just wanted some type of help. I didn't know what inpatient uh, necessarily was, but you know, that's another conversation. Right. Um, so they sent me to um, a different place to, for therapy that was much closer to my house. Cause you know, if you're from the Largo buoy area, driving to Baltimore is a hike hike. So right. um, I wound up going somewhere in like Largo Landover. So that's where I wound up going. I wound up seeing those, those warning signs and basically I turned myself in. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things I want to hit on there. So first I'm originally from Washington DC and lived in PG County. So I know all the different cities you're referencing, but our, my, a lot of our listenership is in California. So they're like, what is Landover? But I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. So these are, these are cities and towns in Maryland, just so for people who don't know. But as far as, where you began. So first you mentioned the anxiety, then later you mentioned depression, and then you mentioned a mental breakdown. So you gave us some insight as to what that looked like. But when it comes to those things, you know, I think people throw terms around flippantly and aren't completely clear on what that means. So with those three terms, anxiety attacks, depression, and a mental breakdown, of those, which were actual uh, medical diagnoses or something where a doctor came in and said, this is what you have or this is what's going on or this is what happened. Okay. The anxiety attacks, the doctor diagnosed it um, and diagnosed me with an anxiety disorder. The uh, mental breakdown, um, a doctor actually let me know, the, a, psych a psychiatrist actually let me know that that's what I was dealing with. Um, and then sent me over to a psychologist. Um, and what was the other term? Depression. Oh, depression. I knew that it was depression because I had been diagnosed with ADHD um, in college. And on my chart was also um, an anxiety disorder as well as manic depressive. And I asked the psychiatrist to leave that off my file because I didn't want to be embarrassed and I didn't want to um, take that back to college with me. Right. So I know there's a general definition. You can Google depression, but if you could speak to what did depression look and feel like for you or what does um, depression look and feel like for you? Depression. Uh, I, I currently uh, have experienced it. Um, if anybody's wondering, it doesn't just uh, go away. Depression feels like, um, imagine you're a superhero, imagine you're the flash and all of a sudden you can't run fast out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. It's like, what's wrong with me? What's going on? And you don't have any answers. What other areas did it affect when you were having your height of symptoms? It affected, um, I would say my social life, I was not available and I was not dependable when it came to my, my social circles. I think it's become a joke now where people say, if somebody asks you, are you on your way? And you know, they'll be still in their bathtub or something. Right. Um, or they'll be like, you know, what are you doing on Friday night? And it's a picture of like Homer Simpson or something in the bed. Mm hmm. I think it's become a joke and I'm not trying to lambast anybody. The the point I'm trying to make is it's actually a real thing to where, you know, as to where you're, you're not even trying to move. You're just like, I'm, I'm not getting out of bed. Um, so it, it's affected me in my social circles. Don't expect me to be on time anywhere. If I even come, it, it'll be late. 
then it's affected my hygiene. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that mental health is one dimensional and that um, it doesn't affect your outward uh, appearance and things like that. I have literally gotten up and had sores on my back, um, like little red spots. Um, this is probably the most embarrassing thing that I, uh, not the most embarrassing, but this whole conversation is difficult, but um, mm-hmm. I've, been, I've been working on having it anyway. Um, shout out to Callie for listening and everybody else. So, uh, but you won't see me. So that's why I'm gonna be able to do this a little bit easier. <laughs> Uh, I have literally not showered for almost a week. I don't know if there's anybody out there that wants to, um, that wants to gamble and see how long they've gone without taking a shower, see if they can beat me. Um, I might, I might win that one. I say even socially, uh, I don't get off of socially in a second. I say even socially, if you invite me somewhere, if I say I'm gonna go, I, it's still going to take me like two hours to even to even realize like that I'm going, but then to realize like I look terrible. I need to shave. I need to cut my hair. I cut my own hair, by the way. I need to cut my hair. I need to get my whole self together before I even leave the house because I look like a mess. Um, I've had red dots on my face um, from laying in bed, which which are still sores. I say it affects my productivity. Just the last two weeks, I took off maybe five days, I'd say, um, and it affected my check. I'm not a salaried employee, so it affected my check. Um, the blessing is I have, uh, because of a um, diagnosis and a disability, I have uh, FMLA, which is the Family Medical Leave Act that I can um, invoke. Um, being able to invoke that means that I, I won't get written up or anything, but, um, my check was cut in half and, um, you know, financially it affected me clearly. And, and it was definitely very, very difficult. Uh, I, I hadn't, I haven't, I hadn't worked out in a, in a whole month up until two days ago. And I, and I'm, I'm being honest for, for a very, very good reason. Me talking about mental health is not because I got it all together. Me talking about it is because I would love to pull other people out of a pit. And I would yeah. love to keep other people from committing suicide or losing their, losing their life to suicide and things like that. I've, I haven't overcome it yet. I'm still working on it. I've, I've, I'm still working on things that work for me that help me to, to overcome it quicker, um, to bounce back faster to the point where I don't even you know, feel the effects anymore, things like that. But I want to make sure that I'm clear that I was literally, you know, depressed a few days ago. You know what I'm saying? So I think I've mentioned three areas. If, if, uh, if you'd like any more, let me know. But I think, um, physically, uh, financially, um, I would be funny and say fiscally just cause it rhymes, but definitely. I appreciate you being that transparent just because I know that the likelihood is there will be people listening who are in the same boat and aren't used to conversations about this publicly and might have discussions privately if they are. But even more so as a black male, uh, I know that, you know, because you mentioned the whole outpatient versus inpatient thing. I know that growing up, there was a stigma around mental health and things of this nature. So there was, there was a fear amongst, I would say, people in my immediate circle and family of you don't want to get diagnosed, you don't want to see a doctor because they'll label you. And it was as if that label goes with you everywhere. And everywhere you go, people are going to know that, you're, that you have a mental illness or they're going to think that you're crazy. That was the, the mindset. Yeah. So people were encouraged not to follow up on clear symptoms. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you were speaking about not going out, I, I understand that being on the other end of it, where I've seen people I'm close to just disconnect completely. Um, I know of someone who I would consider close. We all have a lot of mutual parties, close, basically family, 
And the question was raised about their level of care for the family and the people in our close circle. The question was raised about whether or not they care because they're so disconnected. And there hasn't been a diagnosis or anything of that nature yet. But I do think that from what I've been processing through it as a as a brother and friend, I've had professionals say that that sounds and looks like depression. I've read so much about it just to see how much I could be support. So it it's seeming that way. Um, I'm saying all this to say that have you ever had to deal with other people's reaction to you as far as when you feel more depressed moments? Because my understanding is that comes with a strong desire not to be social, not to go out, not to really do anything. So have you ever been put in a, a difficult position where people who are close to you are wanting to relate to and connect with you, but the depression is is kind of pulling you away and they're receiving it wrong? Absolutely. Um, I come from a family of uh, four sisters, two brothers, um, so seven kids total. And there's, you know, always a bunch of people in the house. Um, now that we're all older and we kind of separated, uh, I was living with my parents. If I haven't said anything embarrassing enough so far, um, I was living with my parents until I was, uh, matter of fact, just, just last year. So I was living with my parents up until 29. Um, I'm sure there's other people that have, uh, you know, yeah. They, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure we can. We can have a. We can go back and forth about this. But 29, you know, was a, is a, is a it's an older age. But um, you know, my mom, you know, she would kind of be like, uh, she would call me by my middle name, and that shows that she's a little worried. And she'd be like, I haven't seen you, and I don't know what's up with you. What's going on? Why don't you come on downstairs and let's talk? Or when do you have time to talk? And my dad would be like, you know, let's get together sometime. Let's talk and let's let's sit down and talk. And what are you doing this weekend? I want to talk. And I'd be like, oh, I don't think I'm going to be available to do that. You know, and I I would make I would completely lie to them and say I'm busy and I'm in my room in my bed. Like I'm not even making up a good lie. I'm not even leaving the house to make it seem like a good lie. I'm in the house. So um, people, I say, have tried to um, be understanding, um, but I don't even think they know that they're being understanding to depression. I think they can just kind of sense it uh, or sense that something's wrong. And I'm more so like separating myself. I go to work, I get in bed. And there was this point that I identified where I can't, I went to work, got in the bed, went to sleep and would wake up and go to work the next day and um it took maybe a month for anybody to really notice um both my parents lived in the home with me as well as my younger brother and my younger sister and um nobody really noticed until maybe like after three months and i think it was my mom that said something and then they i think they started to get a little worried um just because this came to mind real quick i want to mention this um mm -hmm. My mother was was attempting to reach out, but when she kind of detected that it might have been depression, she uh, it was kind of this like pray it away type of attitude, yeah. and it was difficult to digest because I want to give you an example. I went I went to school to be a pastor originally, um, and. Um, after, you know, two years of being in Bible college, you know, I wound up transferring to another school, another Christian school, actually. But um, what I want to say is after originally going to school to be a pastor and knowing how to rightly divide the word of truth and all this other stuff, you know, somebody kind of giving me the pray it away type attitude, I immediately am thinking of a reference in scripture to the woman with the issue of blood. And I know there had to be countless times and countless years that this woman prayed and asked God to remove something from her. And I'm sure that she never wanted to have an issue of blood in the first place. She had to cry out unclean every time she got into a crowd and everybody had to run. She had to literally say, hey, I'm, I'm dirty. Like, I, I couldn't live if I had to speak up and say, 
hey, I was diagnosed with bipolar. Everybody would be like, ooh, oh, he's crazy, or uh, he's weak. You know, some of the reactions I've actually gotten in real life. Um, right. But but she dealt with that for 12 years, and not once did it go away. Like, she prayed on top of prayed. She prayed, prayed. And after 12 years, she finally touched the hem of Jesus' garment and went away. And sometimes that attitude um, can really be disheartening because it's like, you think I want it? You think I asked for it? You think that I don't want to be normal? I, I, I've known a couple of people that their their goal in life is to be normal. One of the things that um, that people do that have dealt with mental illness that I know of, they'll they'll do drugs. You you want to feel, so you'll do something that'll make you feel. It's a risk. Uh, it it gets your heart rate going, and you, all of a sudden you feel something. So, trust me, this is not an area where it's like. Just pray it away. So, um, like I said, my mother and my father, you know, they kind of noticed it after a few months. Um, then finally, my mom t- took another step forward from that and, and it kind of gave me the pray it away attitude. And then I was just like, wow. So, yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. But unfortunately, that is just so common. You know, that's why I wanted to have the conversation that we, we kind of stigmatize mental health. And then if you're black and Christian, a lot of times it's, you know, pray it away. And I don't want to discount the power of prayer, but I think the idea of faith without works being dead is that we have that faith in God. And I think that's evidence in our prayers, but we should also be moved. Um, and God has provided medical resources for us to take advantage of them. And if we and if you're able to resolve an issue without them, then that's fine too. But uh, it's it's good to explore additional options. And I would just say to all those listening, even as someone who may not be dealing with it directly, I just would say that it's never appropriate to to suggest that as the solution. I think in these cases, it's best for you to pray for the person. Yes. But as someone, as the person wrestling through it, what I'm hearing is it's almost kind of patronizing or frustrating to drop that on top of you as if you haven't exhausted all the possibilities to rid yourself of something that is, makes life hard for you. Absolutely. That is definitely, um, that is definitely on, on point. Um, it's actually interesting that um, that you mentioned it in that way. There's uh, there was a pastor that um, committed suicide that I was following on Twitter. Um, you know, he lost his life to suicide, and it changed a lot of people around me. It changed their reaction to mental health a little bit because um, they were like, "Wow, like he was a good pastor. He was leading the church in prayer. He was shepherding a church, and he was always happy." And he lost his life to suicide. And I'm like, listen, God showed me when I wanted to take my own life at one point that it is spiritual and that it is mental. Um, that's why I prayed away. It doesn't just work. Um, I love that you said faith that I works is dead. There's works that, that can also be done. So in this case, if, if you were to say to somebody, you got diabetes, but I just want you to jog every day and I should do it. Like, no, like you, you should be taking the, the, the medication that they give you and you should also be exercising, but we're not going to do just one together. We want you to be back in a hundred percent good health and then we'll wean off of things. If we can find holistic ways to do it, let's find holistic ways to do it as well. Um, but we're not just going to sit here and be like, yeah, I'm just going to pray or yeah, I'm just going to run. I apologize to everybody that might have a different level of faith than I do. But um, I don't believe it works that way. Um, and I'll make sure not to make this lengthy. But I've, I've observed a couple of things while on my, on my walk with Christ. Um, you can pray and ask God to remove something. And God has the ability to remove it. Paul had a thorn in his side. And he wrote about it. He said, you know, there's a thorn in his side. I believe it was uh, seizures, uh, little, little seizures or um, a stuttering problem. Um, 
some something along the lines of those two and um you know like a tick or something and he asked god to take away from him all the time and paul who literally wrote the majority of the new testament Mm -hmm. he would be one of the guys that we can rest our entire faith on um and say like man paul you know he's the reason why i'm here you know he made so many disciples that it, it got to it reached me you know however you might look at forget i said that it, it it would just be something that shows the effect that he had on right the right. Term disciple and on the christian world in itself and even he you. was saying uh what'd you say i said i'm with you i'm following what you, the point you're trying to make okay and even then he would say god removed this storm from me and god wasn't taking the storm away from him um and that god's grace is sufficient for him and what i've learned is you can be flawed but you can be called Anytime that there's a, a broken vessel, um, I've heard Pastor Keith Battle talk about this. If there's a broken vessel, if it's cracked, you know, you you have to leave it under running water in order for it to stay full. You can take a vase that is perfectly, you know, together and leave it under water, but then it'll just run over. So you can go put it on the counter, come back, it'll still be full. Ten days from now, it'll probably still be full. It might evaporate a little bit, but still be full. But a broken a broken vessel. Um, with cracks in it and things like that, you got to leave it under running water for it to be full. And sometimes I think that's 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 what God requires of us, um, so that we don't get too full of ourselves. And if that's what we're doing, and that's what the thorn in our flesh is causing us to do, it's giving glory to God. When it comes to mental health, yeah, we could pray it away. Yeah, God, give me the easy way out. Give me the easy option. But sometimes God is like, hey. My grace is sufficient for you. And to be honest, I really need you to stay close to me because I can see your future. I can see what I have in store for you. And if you don't stay close to me, I can lose you. You know, like, what is it? What is it to gain the whole world and lose your soul? Well, God gave you a thorn in your flesh so that you don't gain the whole world and lose your soul. And I'm just going to say Salah at the end of that. Yeah, (laughs) that's good. So something i want to pivot toward is we spoke about stigmas as it relates to mental health and the black community but i think it gets even more nuanced amongst men i think uh a lot of times even amongst close friends guys can be friends forever you know call each other brother but still not talk about personal things like this so Oftentimes, if it is something that's affecting you socially, others see it. Have you had any difficulty as far as expressing or dealing with these variety of issues that come as a result of depression or the anxiety? Have you found any difficulty in talking through this with other men? Or absolutely, absolutely. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, you can't tell another grown man. Hey, um, I lost my breath back there. I was having an anxiety attack. But yeah. um, one of the things I've realized is that's how you find out who your real friends are. Being able to literally be honest and frank with somebody. Hey, man, I'm going to just be honest. I had an anxiety attack. Um, I called you first. And um, if you could really help to calm me down, that, that'd be great. You're, you're my favorites. You're one of my boys. Um, if you could help me, yeah, that'd be wonderful. And I have friends like that. Um, I found out who they were after going through some things. And when I say God blessed me with some very, very good friends, God blessed me with some great guys um, that I that I can share with. They know what medications I'm taking. Um, they know what circumstances I'm in or, or the amount of stress that I feel like I'm under if I'm dealing with some type of stress. And they also know when I'm depressed. Like, I'm not just going to continue to to do it by myself when i have guys that have proven time and time again that they'll that they'll be there for me yeah it's good to have have guys in your corner so in addition to that what would you say is a because some some may hear this and realize that they may have been short or dismissive of certain characteristics that came up in with with their friend so for someone who's trying to be more sensitive, more aware, and respond in a better way to a friend who may be having similar issues, 
What do you think are some things to note as far as responding to a friend who may be having depressive episodes or anxiety attacks or any other oh. other mental issue? Okay, uh, do me a favor. Uh, ask me, I mean, tell me um, that you've been having a, depress- a depressive episode. Uh, tell me that you're having depressive issues right now. I've been feeling really depressed recently. Oh man, I'm I'm sorry to hear that. Is there anything I can do for you right now? I'm not sure what to do to make it go away. Well, how about this, man? Um, I'm just gonna drop by and we're gonna get some food and we'll talk. Does that work for you? Yeah. So at that point, I'm able to engage you, but I'm I'm able to listen. And I think not having the answer is perfect. I don't need to have the answer to whatever somebody's telling me is going on in their life. All I got to do is be there. Um, it's, it's really the, the fact that you're there that's important. I've, I've noticed that there's this correlation with, um, okay, so I was instructed not to say committed suicide necessarily. Um, I was instructed to say lost their life to suicide right. because one is saying like you couldn't have prevented it basically. And it's a tragedy, obviously. The other one is saying um, something completely different. And the more I've tried to understand that, the more I realize that the person that is just there for you is saving you. And it doesn't matter if they showed up and they had all the answers. It matters that they showed up. Does that make sense? Yeah. So just being able to to, to show up and just being able to be there, um, it does take a little bit of extra effort. By, by asking the question in the first place, but being there to listen and, and um, absorb sometimes can be make a world of a difference. Yeah. As the friend of someone who's, tr- who's working through these issues, what would you say about the other extreme of someone who isn't just having the issues, but is also really not open to allowing people to be there? Let's, let's just say they, they may respond or engage with conversation every eight months but outside of that they completely disconnect how do you support someone whose issues are causing them to to disconnect completely it's really tough um because i've been that person before and um i'm not even gonna pretend like that question didn't just excite me that that question excited me actually so I've been that person. I literally told uh, one of my closest friends that I've mentioned earlier that I'm so appreciative of um, that I'm going through a lot and that I'm depressed. And they said, all right, can you can you answer the phone real quick? You know, can we talk for a moment? I said, I'd rather be under a rock right now. But thanks. Hmm. And um, I look back at that text message like a week ago and I was just like, man, like that person was reaching out and giving me their, their hand. And I totally was just like, nah, let me stay down here. Uh, when it comes to that, I've noticed, I've noticed that. How do I want to slice this up? All right. Um, you know how with women, we pursue women, we learn what they like and what they don't like. And we try, we try to place what they like in front of them. Mm Mm-hmm. Hey, notice me. Hey, I'm interested. Uh, we pursue women. One of the things that is also a stigma for men and other men is that pursuit is, is, is only for women. Yeah. And I got to be honest and say pursuit is also for other men. Um, first of all, if you're going to win souls, you, you have to pursue men. You have to pursue, right. If you're going to mentor men, you got to pursue men. Um, if you're going to save men from taking their own lives, you got to pursue them. Uh, if you're going to save a man from being in a depressive episode by himself, you, you got to pursue him. So one of the things that I've done in the past was I pursued a young man and um, I called him, called him, called him. He didn't answer. I was like, yo, what's going on with this dude? Um, I was like, all right, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to drive by his house and let's see what happens. Drove by his house and he wasn't home. I was like, man, I don't know what to do. 
So I just prayed about it. And then the next day, I felt like God was telling me to drive by his house again. I was like, I just drove by his house. He wasn't even home. I drove by his house. His mom was home. And I used to coach this young man. So I talked to his mom, and she was like, oh, my gosh, coach, he's really needed you. I need you to come over here and spend some time with him. Can you do that? So I went over, and I, I cut his hair, and we talked. And he was in good spirits, you know, after that. But I pursued him, pursued him, pursued him until, boom, you know, I got him. Yeah. So I'm I'm glad you said that because it, it kind of made a light bulb go off for me, and it's it's encouraging to hear other guys thinking through it in that way and recognizing that it's it's a serious thing. I have a um I have a book coming out later this year on black male identity. And one of the a lot of it is debunking myths that we believe. And one of the myths is that only romantic relationships require work or or pursuit essentially. So I'm glad to hear that someone else is, is thinking through things in that way and recognizing that just as much as we put work into our romantic relationships with women, we have to recognize like it takes work to be a good and supportive friend, a good and supportive brother, son, so on and so forth. Those are all all relationships need work and development, not just the romantic ones. Um, otherwise, you have a very mm-hmm. limited limited relationships. Uh, mm-hmm. So, speaking of relationships, uh, I understand you got married recently. How, I did. Uh, how? Do these dynamics work as far as you working through this personally? And as you mentioned, their pursuit, explaining these things, and then now uh, being being one and working through it together. What has what that transition been like? And what is something to that you can pass on to others who may be carrying some of these difficulties into a relationship? Okay, so um, I actually met my wife um at one of my mental health meetups so i have mental health meetups and um i travel and do them anywhere that somebody would like to have one california if you're interested you know how to get me um (laughs) so i I will literally have these meetups and i'll talk i'll teach and then um I'll, i'll i'll basically open up the floor to you know talk about personal experiences for everybody things like that and my wife just happened to be there she was my, obviously she was just somebody that was showing up, but she knew me on day one. She knew basically what my background was, what my testimony was, my diagnoses and all that. Everybody in there knows. So she knew about it on day one. And one thing I would encourage brothers to do is, is to be honest. And I'm, I don't want somebody to ruin their life, but I do want somebody to be honest to see who your real friends are, see who is really interested in you for you. Mm-hmm. It's very, it's very difficult to let somebody know who you really are when it's too late. You know, we, we spend all this time trying to show the opposite sex that I'm some type of celebrity or something. Um, that when you find out that something's fake, that the whole perception kind of dies. Um, right. You know, I don't know if you ever met anybody that has, you know, fake body parts or implants, but you could be so attracted to them that all of a sudden you're like, ugh. So you you made up of 40% Mattel products and plastic? Yeah. And that's that's the wrong thing. So if, if you had 40 people to choose from and the dating pool was terrible and now you're talking about your mental health, oh, man, now you're only going to have one person to choose from. That's great. That's that's a start. So she knew about the things that I had been talking about from day one. I learned a lot about her, actually, because she talked about her experiences um, in the meetups. And also, um, I would say being able to give her the rundown of what's going on with me has been very, very helpful because when dealing with depression, I don't eat. I don't get out of bed. I don't bathe. And... These last two weeks, she fed me, and that changed my life. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like that was fun as a single man. That, dealing with depression by yourself is not any fun. Dealing with depression and, and you have a spouse that cares about you and is praying for you and is looking to get you back on your feet, you get back up on your feet 
two times as fast. Mm -hmm. So instead of me being out for much longer, I, I was only out for five days. So thank God, you know, she was understanding. She asked me what could she do for me. And as I, as I, as I thought of things, she was there. She, she showed up. So in relationships, I can't stress this enough. It's so vital to your life that you have partners that are prepared to battle with you. So let's say, let's say both, both of y'all show up with the, um, a sword and shield to battle. You can go fight together. You know, one person facing this way, the other person facing another way. You got each other's backs. Cool. But if you show up with somebody that don't have any weapons, you most likely going to get killed. You can't be the only person attacking and defending. Um, so you definitely want to be in battle with somebody that can also fight. Mental health wise, you definitely want to be able to disclose information. That way you're able to do as well as you can um, with assistance or you're able to succeed or somebody propelling you into your destiny. It, it'll take you a lot longer, basically, if you if you rely on yourself to bear your burden by yourself. Mm -hmm. In closing, I want to give people an opportunity to to connect with you, because I think not just that you're speaking about it is unique, but the way that you speak about it is is practical and relatable and real. Um, and I think it's so big that you spoke about it from a place of I haven't mastered this. I'm just working through it. Uh, so if anyone's interested in connecting with you just to ask questions for the mental health check ins or anything like that, how can they best connect with you? Um, please connect with me on um, Instagram. I would love to connect with anybody that reaches out. And um, my name, my my Instagram handle is um, Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, the speaker. You should be able to type that in and I'll, I'll basically populate after Wardell Curry. <laughs> um, <laughs> up, 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 up right after you see his face on there. And again, like I, I really want to connect with people and let's say there's 500 people listening. Like, please take this moment to pull out your phone and follow me. I don't want followers and I don't want people to know what I deal with, but I do want to connect with people and I do want to point them in the right direction. I do want to be able to share what works for me. Like there's literally some posts that I've made, um, wearing my, my bunny suit. I have this, this, uh, this bunny suit from the the Christmas movie, uh, the, from, the, from the Christmas movie or whatever, uh, Christmas story. And I'll post in it in the days that like, I'm, I'm depressed. And like when, when you look at it, it's kind of like, how can you take this seriously? Like, I'm, I got, I got to feel a little bit better. Like, how can I take this seriously? Um, but I, but I post, I try to post even on my bad days, but mm -hmm. as I'm walking through it, like I really want to share things that will really help somebody else. So please, you're not following me because I want any type of fame. I really want to connect with people as I'm telling my story, as embarrassing as it, as it can be, because I want to keep people from taking their own lives. Right. Well, I thank you for giving a, a large audience of people some insight into some, some private areas, but I think it's ultimately for a good reason and it'll be beneficial long term. So thank you for coming on. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for being open. This is Malik Blade, and that was Guest Who.